conversation. I got a little bit ahead of myself last week. I announced that we were on episode seven, when in fact we were on episode six, and this is officially episode seven. And I'm delighted and indeed honoured to welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library tonight, Patrick McCafferty. I should tell you that um, Patrick is a name that I've been familiar with for years because I, I, I read his book, uh, the aforementioned, well, I haven't mentioned it yet, actually, uh, The Celtic Gods, uh, which he co-wrote with Mike Bailey. And uh, so I knew, I knew his name. And then after Professor J.P. Mallory appeared on our show, uh, he started uh, recommending other quote unquote victims for me to talk to. And one of those was Patrick. And I jumped at the chance uh, because Patrick and I have a mutual interest in mythology and in comets. So I'm hoping this will be an interesting conversation. I'm sure it will be. I hope you find it interesting. A couple of things before we start, just to say these episodes are all recorded. And uh, I know there's a few people who've said they can't make it. The video will be made, made available, hopefully before the end of the night, the video will be up on YouTube for people to rewatch or to watch for the first time. Uh, the second thing is that uh, a, a lot of this is made possible thanks to the generous support of the Mythical Ireland community. And in that regard, if you want to become a patron of Mythical Ireland, uh, please feel free to have a look at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. You get rewarded for your patronage. Uh, it's not just uh, uh, it's not just uh, support for the sake of it. I should also say happy International Women's Day to everybody, all, especially to all our uh, female viewers around the world. And uh, I hope you're having a great day. I hope you haven't been uh, doing any work. I hope you've been having a relaxing day. Um, before we get kicked off, uh, Patrick, if you forgive the advertising, I should also mention that uh, Return to Segish, my new book, uh, is printed and is now in the bindery. So I'm hoping to have copies by the end of next week. And if it was a thing that you thought you might be interested in um, uh, getting yourself a copy, I'll just paste a link in as to where you can pre-order it there on the Mythical Ireland website. All copies signed by myself and posted. Doesn't matter where you are in the world, we can post worldwide. Thankfully, Ireland has a decent uh, postal and upwards or downwards or sideways, depending on which way we go. Patrick, you're very welcome along and I hope you are keeping well. Oh, uh, thanks Anthony, yeah, good. Um, I will say that I'm, I'm an hour ahead of everybody. So I'm probably more tired than anybody here. Uh, so if I uh, start rambling, then you'll know why. So. <laughs> uh, don't worry, I'm sure you won't. Um, Patrick, it is customary for me to begin each uh, conversation by just asking the guests to introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about your background, where are you from, and particularly how you became interested in the areas that you've written about and studied. Okay, um, I guess I was born in Glasgow, uh, but my parents moved back to Donegal uh, before I was four. And I grew up in the Donegal Geltacht. So, and that's an area that has very little archaeology. It's sort of like a, an empty quarter until a plantation, basically. Nobody or very few people lived in that area. But it has stories and it has, you know, rocks and boulders and stories about the rocks and boulders. So there was always this idea of uh, Balor, for example, had turned his eye on his army and, and left a, a whole field of boulders on Bloody Foreland. So that's the sort of area that I grew up with. Uh, it's Donegal, so it gets a lot of rain. Um, so the sky was not always visible, but when it was, it was spectacular. It was, uh, you know, kind of the dark sky uh, that you don't really get there anymore uh, because there are too many traffic lights, but or street lights. But back then, you could see the Milky Way. You could see all of this. Mm. Um, so that was kind of my introduction. My mother bought a child craft encyclopedia. Um, and one of the, there were a couple of volumes to this. Um, some of them were in poetry, some of them were in stories, and one was on space, uh, the world in space. And that whetted an interest in, um, in astronomy, uh, but also in stories and, and legends and, and tales. So, so that, I guess, that's kind of early. And then I, went on to study engineering, um, 
you know, so mythology, astronomy were very much not what I was interested in. Um, but I took a year where I was traveling around Bahrain, Oman, um, India. And in Bahrain, I became, I came across the, the Dilmun sort of civilization, these ruins, became interested in archaeology. And then in India, I became interested in mythology and archaeology and languages. I mean, it, it was, it amazed me, first of all, that, you know, the numbers one, two, three, four in Hindi sounded like Irish, like ek do teen char, hein do chri kar. And, and that whetted this sort of interest in Indo-Europeans. So uh, when I came back to Ireland, I think I ended up buying Jim Mallory's book, In Search of the Indo-Europeans. I was interested in, um, yeah, the stories. And, and then I ended up reading the Thanbwa Kulnya and the Mahabharata sort of side by side. And in both of them, the heroes went away somewhere to get training and they became trained in weapons. And then they arrived back with these fabulous weapons. Um, so in the case of Kukhalin, he goes off to Skaha and comes back with the uh, Gabolga. Um, and in India, they come back with, I think it was Bhima goes away and then comes back with these Astras. And these Astras were such incredibly powerful weapons that today on the internet, there's kind of debate among people about whether Bronze Age India had invented nuclear weapons already, uh, because there's, this is the only way to explain the power of these weapons. And, um, but it, you know, I, I personally now think that, okay, these are probably meteors or in fireballs and, and that there is an explanation for this that without requiring advanced technology. Um, so that's that. And then the archeological side was whetted, I think through Newgrange. I never heard about Newgrange till I was 21. I mean, this is unbelievable, but archaeology was not part of the primary school curriculum. It wasn't part of the secondary school curriculum. We had history, we had geography, archaeology fell between those stools. And I heard of it when I was 21 and I visited it when I moved back to, I lived in Germany and then I moved back to uh, Dublin and I visited Newgrange and became hooked on that. And then in Cork, um, I had friends, Simon Skinner, Pam Skinner, they invited me to um, look at a stone circle. So we went to Temple Bryan Stone Circle in Clonakilty. And, and again, I became fascinated. It was just, I never heard of stone circles until that day. And I remember sitting in one of these, wondering what it was about, what, why people had built this. And at the time I, I, was in, I became interested in, was that Jack Roberts had a little booklet then on stone circles. So I would head out at weekends with his little booklet and go to these stone circles and look at the astronomical alignments. And, and then I realized there's some, to explain these sites, I needed to look at the sky, at the archeology, span but also at stories. Because if people were building monuments to their gods, and I presume this was was happening. And let's say that some of those gods at least were sky gods, then there should be some clues to why they did this in the alignments, in the, in the archeology, span the way the monuments are laid out, but then also in the stories that we have. So I spent quite a lot of time reading, um, reading about, um, you know, mythology. So reading stories, reading archeological books and trying to kind of put the pieces together. And I, initially I was thinking of the sun and moon and it was only, it was later that I actually kind of stumbled across this idea of comets and, and that seemed to make much more sense. Yeah, I'm not surprised by the way about archeology span being on the curriculum. It wasn't on the curriculum for us either. In fact, I distinctly remember that the whole of the prehistoric period in the history books in primary school consisted of one page talking about hunter gatherers and Newgrange and all of a sudden we were on to St. Patrick, you know, it's like now we've got that out of the way, let's talk about something else. Um, it's very interesting too about Donegal, I, I kind of realised the extent of how how, how much there is a connection there with Balor and the story of Balor, because, you know, if you were, if you, if you didn't know Donegal and you'd never been, you would assume that uh, Balor's connection is mainly with Sligo and Moitura and his defeat and all the rest. And here down in Donegal, they have this entire similar but separate story about 
uh, Balor's eye being pierced and the poison uh, oozing out, forming the poison gland and all that. Fascinating stuff. Um, I need to ask you before <laughs> before we kind of really get going. Um, have you personally seen many comets yourself? And if so, have you have a, do you have a favorite? Um, I, I haven't, to be honest. Um, I think I've probably seen about five. Um, the I saw Halley's Comet in 1986, and or 1985 actually, and I just started studying engineering in UCD, and I saw that they had an astronomy club. So I joined the astronomy club, and they had a, an evening of um, where they set up the telescope outside the physics building, and uh, I went along, and I saw Halley's Comet through the telescope, and it was probably the biggest disappointment of my life. I had been waiting all my life uh, to see Halley's Comet. And I mean, this was a special moment. It was in my lifetime. It was the only time I would see it. And there it was. And it was like looking at a cotton wool, a ball of cotton wool through binoculars, you know, where the, the ball of cotton wool is about a mile away. Mm. That was it. I, I just had this yeah. overwhelming sense of letdown. Yeah. And, Anticlimax, and, disappointment, yeah. It didn't help, of course, at the time that the media hyped it up because the people who are writing a lot of the articles in the media didn't understand the nature of comets. And that bright, really bright comets are like a twice or three times in a lifetime phenomenon, depending on how long you live. Um, so likewise, I also saw Halley's Comet in 1985 as a tiny dim smudge and thought, like you, is that it? I mean, really, you know? Yeah. Um, but just just for those of you who aren't astronomers, um, uh, comets are a favorite of mine. I have no idea why. I have spent 25 years of my life hunting for comets. They are 90% of them beyond uh, the reach of everything but the largest telescopes and binoculars. Tremendously disappointing most of the, the time. And then occasionally we get these uh, fabulous displays. I'm sure, Patrick, you saw Comet Hale Bop, which was probably the greatest comet of our lifetime. Um, th that was the next one I saw. And that was, I saw that in the desert uh, just outside, um, it was in Dubai, in fact, and um, and it was clear and it was it was hanging there in the sky. And, um, and that whetted the interest again. So that was, you know, that was what, 1997. Um, so that whetted an interest. And then I think 2007, so it's like, like every 10 years nearly, uh, 2007 had Comet McNaught and Comet Holmes. And McNaught was interesting. I, I saw it in Belfast, but it was disappointing in Belfast. And, but then it went down to, it was visible from Australia. Yes. And in Australia, it became this incredible, um, let me see if I can share that. Oh, brilliant. So it became this incredible uh, comet with this kind of dust trail wow. that looked like a horse's mane. And, and this was fascinating because Pliny had described a, a comet type called Hippias that looks like a horse's mane. And this was the first time I'd seen anything like that. So I remember that because, you know, the pictures were coming up on the internet and in the media. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe we're missing this. And it was impossible for us to see without taking a flight into the deep Southern hemisphere. Yeah. And that's the nature of these things that sometimes, I mean, uh, Neowise in July of last year was very much a Northern hemisphere. So our Australian friends were, were, were uh, on the opposite side of things this time, the shoe was on the other foot. Um, yeah, that's so. Were you in Australia for that? Were you? No, I wasn't. And, I, and I've come to realize that sometimes you get the best images of comets are in pictures. They're from the astronomers. They're on the astronomy picture of the day of the day, um, and they're in old books. And um, I, actually, Neowise reminds me reminded me of Comet Donati. Uh, this one from eighteen fifty eight. But Comet Holmes was two thousand seven as well, and that was spectacular as well. I could see that it was as big as the moon in the sky. I mean, it was, and it became like this enormous eye. So it was a small comet on its way back out and somewhere, I think past Mars, it, something happened it. It sort of had a puff of activity and uh, nobody knew why. And suddenly it blazed into light. Yeah. Um, like a, to, I would liken this to an eye in the sky. And, um, and that, that I think is probably my favorite. Um, so. 
brilliant. Uh, so, so then we naturally move on to uh, how uh, you, you, you alluded to it in your opening remarks, but w when did the idea that comets were mentioned in, in mythology first appear to you? Um, I think the first time I came across this idea was, uh, was it would have been 2000. And I read a report in the Irish Times that a scientist in Belfast, who is an expert in tree rings, had um, come up with this opinion that Cuchulain was a comet. And my first reaction was, that is ridiculous. Absolutely no way. <laughs> this is, uh, there's just like that, that's not going to work. Cuchulain is a warrior, he's a Celtic hero. This is, he is not a comet. And, um, and that kind of lodged there. That, that was kind of my initial impression and I forgot about it. And, um, and then I became, I used to say, I became interested in archeology span and I joined up, a there was a class that UCC, so University College Cork had a class called, um, it was a certificate on introduction to Irish archeology. span And it was a fantastic class. They, it was an extramural class. It was held in Charleville. So I had to drive there once, like every Wednesday during the winter. And they, they basically took their archeologists and they presented the Neolithic, so Elizabeth Chi Tuig and the Bronze Age. And I had Mick Monk and environmental stuff. And it was, it was great, really, really interesting. But Barra O'Donovan was looking at the Bronze Age and he mentioned that Mike Bailey had come up with this theory that there was a, or discovered that there was a 20 year period where oaks were suffering in Ireland and that he had attributed the Bronze Age collapse to this. And I was fascinated by this because as a chemical engineer, a lot of my work had been on trying to mitigate the effect of, the, of humans on the environment. And then to suddenly have this turned around to realize that the environment could affect human society was an idea that, that really uh, intrigued me. So I immediately ordered his book from the local book, bookshop and went through it. And I, yeah, I liked it, I enjoyed it, bought into it. And it was, I think later I was reading the Tain Bo Cunha and I came across a passage in the Tain where Cuchulain went through his, um, his ball and his spear uh, and his and his hockey, his hurley stick into the air. And then he caught them before they hit the ground. So that basically says that these things were going through the air and pretty much kept going through the air. And I sketched this out and realized that this effectively was the, the were the two tails of a comet and the coma, that it, it was this nice diagram. And that was what woke my sort of image or my interest in, this imagery in Irish mythology. And there was, I, I, and once that was done, there was no stopping me. There was this sort of, it was like unlocking things. I started to see comets everywhere and, um, and I couldn't stop seeing comets everywhere. And it's something that I, I think Iris Murdoch talks about this, or she wrote, talked about this where you become interested in a topic and she says, no matter what it is, let's say it's Frisian cows, you, suddenly we'll see all sorts of references to Frisian cows over the next week or two. And, and I had something similar then with comets. Uh, let me share a, another screen here, just with a few of these. Again, so I see comets everywhere. I'm like that kid in sixth sense. And I'll see the name. I, I will see like the national lottery with its star with another little set of trailing stars. Comet electricals, um, your images here, champagne bottles. Um, we have Christmas trees. It took me a while to realize that the Christmas tree with its big star on top and its sort of bright tail was a potential comet. Um, and then like Fine Gael, we have a star. And now what happens here, of course, is a PR person comes along and goes, okay, you've got a star as your logo, but let's make it dynamic. Let's make it move. So before you know it, your star is now moving and it, you've got effectively a comet image. Uh, the same with, let's say, John McCain. So that, um, as I say, suddenly I was seeing comets everywhere. I was going through these stories and then asking this question, okay, 
I see this comet image. Can I interpret it? How would it make sense as a, as a story about a comet? And I started trying to interpret the stories. Now, around this time, I, I've decided to, after doing the, um, the CERT course, I realized that I had enough money put aside that I could take a year off work and that I could do a master's course in archaeology. And UCC had a two-year master's, whereas Belfast had a one-year master's. And it was advertised in Archaeology Ireland, which again was one of these uh, you know, books that I read or magazines that I read. So I applied for this one-year MA, and that was 2002, went to Belfast, and, um, and there, yep, I had you know, two modules and we had to do a dissertation. And I approached Jim Mallory with a topic for my dissertation and he kind of advised me not to go near it. Uh, so, but suggested very kindly that I take a look at three other potential topics. One of these was a dictionary topic. Another was um, the origins of the Greeks. That sounded interesting. And the third suggestion was that I take a look at the Finn McCool stories and do what he had done with the Ulster cycle and look at the archaeology in the stories. And I immediately liked the idea of that. He knew I could speak Irish. Okay, so that would make it a bit easier. So that's what I did uh, for my dissertation topic. And then I did something um, that you should never do. I tell my students now never to do this, never to come up with two theses, all right? You've got an idea, you bring your thesis right through it and you finish there. So I did the archaeological side, analyzed a whole pile of the Finn McCool stories. And at the same time, I was like going through them going, oh, that looks like a comet. That looks like a comet. And, and trying to interpret them this way. So by the end of it, I had two half dissertations, one on the archaeology and then the other on the comet side. And I wrote those up, submitted it, um, did okay, but I think, uh, you know, Jim wasn't, he was kind of disappointed by the second half. And then Mike and I uh, decided to collaborate and write a book um, and that became the Celtic Gods then, so. What was uh, the first book, um, Mike's book that prompted your interest? Was it's that... From Exodus to Arthur. Ah, yes, yep. very good. Yeah, yeah, that one. We'll give it a plug. So just in case anybody's looking for reading material, some, some people are complaining that I recommend too many books on their bookshelves are creaking under the weight. <laughs> so there you go. There's two books that you must have. Um, yeah, I, before I get on to the next question, I wanted to sort of read a statement from your book uh, with Mike, The Celtic Gods, Comets and Irish Mythology, which I would have to say I broadly agree with. And of course, anybody who's been following the series over the last year will know myths are not exaggerated fiction, but are instead fairly accurate accounts of real events in the sky. I would broadly agree with that. Is it the case that scholars of myth have been perhaps too occupied or preoccupied with the notion of sun worship, therefore preventing them from considering other bright objects of the sky? Um, yeah, I mean, yes, <laughs> it, it, I, I would agree with, uh, there. I mean, the idea that myths are exaggerated fiction, these stories are filled with details that don't belong to the to our world. They they're impossible. So a character shines brightly, travels very very quickly, you know, throws a weapon or a thunderbolt that you know kills a hundred thousand people or whatever. So you have these details in stories that we know are impossible, and that's led us to this view that the word myth is the same as the word lie, and you know, so so we have this now about, I don't know, it was like Max Muller, um, you know, was became interested in languages, realized that you have Deus Pater, you have this Jupiter, this word that seemed to suggest, I think, shining father, and that, you know, made sense as a, um, as a god character and as a solar god character. So he, you know, came out with this idea of a sun god. Now, the sun god makes sense. And I think what happened then for some time was that he tried, ended up explaining almost everything through the sun god idea. Um, I guess other people have gone through the same sort of, yeah, I guess pitfall. I mean, J uh, Fraser does the same with the golden bow where he explains everything as a vegetative. Robert Graves does it where he explains everything in terms of the moon, um, you know, and the white goddess. 
and and I think I've probably and Mike and I have probably done the same with um, the Celtic gods in terms of comets, where we've gone through it and explained things in terms of comets. Um, I've probably now be more conscious that there are different explanations, that there are that myths work on many different levels, that they often can't be reduced to one single idea. But certainly the dominant idea was the sun god. And this dominated a lot of the, the Irish material as well. Um, in fact, you have to be careful sometimes. I mean, I came across a wonderful, there was a wonderful piece that we actually use in the Celtic gods, where Cúchollín is on his way to Skaha and he meets the youth who is rolling the wheel along the plain and the, the wheel is, you know, emitting rays like the sun and it's drying the ground. And I looked for this in the Irish text, couldn't find it. Eleanor Hull had it in her English text. I spent ages trying to find this in the original Irish. I, I wanted to have this piece in my PhD, uh, in my thesis, and I couldn't get it. And then I read her preface where I realized that she was so convinced by the solar idea, a solar mythology idea, that she'd just written this in to the passage so that she had sort of brought it in as a, almost as a sense, as a work of fiction. And that was one of those areas where I realized that I had to go back to the original texts for many of these stories. Uh, you couldn't rely on translations. This is something we'd also experienced with Lady Gregory um, and her translation of Cúchollín's Réistru. Yeah, it's something absolutely you have to be very careful with. I mean, even in last week's regular episode of Live Irish Myths, we spoke about Arnia Fingen, Fingen's Night Watch. And there were, in fact, um, words that have been translated. For instance, he kept referring to Halloween. And of course, Halloween is translated from Samhain. And Samhain and Halloween, as far as I'm concerned, are two distinct, very different things, you know. Um, so I admire you definitely for referring to the original Irish and trying to find, uh, you, you know, the truth in the detail. Also, the broad statement that, of course, mythology is a very valid and real sort of version of history uh, and uh, certainly cannot be reduced to uh, storytelling and, uh, as you say, lies. Um, before we get into the absolute nitty gritty detail, I, I wanted to ask you, from your work with, you know, looking at comets through the lens of myth, uh, do you think, because one of the things that I read in astronomy books when I was a kid was that comet, the appearance was co of comets was generally considered terrifying or at the very least unsettling to ancient peoples around the globe. Is this something that's borne out in the mythology? Um, there's rarely a connection between comets and the myths that's explicit. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly uh, people were terrified of comets. And in the stories, they have mythical characters who are terrifying and who do terrifying things. Uh, so when you put those two together, um, it seems that yes, we have many terrific, terrible characters who do, you know, who create destruction, etc. And so the stories are full of those types of characters. We can definitely say historically that people were terrified of comets. Uh, when you look through records, I think there are I think Carl Sagan identified one or two comets in India that were seen as having done good on Earth. And he says these were the exception that every, almost every single society around the world viewed comets as an evil sign, a sign of uh, ill fortune, of you know, uh, plague, of wars, etc. And um, and it, it's it's quite there's an interesting, let me see if I can share this again. share this. I mean, there's a diagram of Halley's Comet in 1456, and it's associated with all sorts of warnings, like blood from the sky, um, you know, these ma sort of malformations, uh, earthquakes, etc. You have this John Gadbury writing in the 17th century, um, these blazing stars threaten the world with famine, plague, and wars. Uh, to princes' death, to kingdoms' many crosses, to all estates' inevitable losses, to herdsmen rot, to plowmen hapless seasons, to sailors' storms, to cities' civil treasons. So, so basically, the comets got blamed for everything, and um, and that's a large amount of that is superstition. Now, the 
related to their capricious nature. Like everything else that happens in the sky, the sun, the moon, and the planets is predictable. It fo- they follow patterns. Comets just literally appear out of nowhere. Yes, and they indicate a change in the heavens, so that means a change on the earth. Because if people, if this, if what you see in the sky is a warning, or if you can use astrology to predict what will happen on earth, then a major change in the heavens means that there's a major change in earth. And there's always something happening on earth that's changing. Um, you know, so, so it's easy to put two and two together and blame the comet. Now, the one group of people who did have to watch out were kings because the comet warned that the death of the king was imminent. And if you're a king or a queen, this was dangerous, downright dangerous, because anybody planning a plot kind of had a sign from the heavens that their plot was going to work. This is the time. And I kind of um, semi sort of wrote, I think when I saw Comet Neowise last year, I kind of wrote a slightly tongue in cheek piece, imagining Donald Trump looking up at this comet, worried that it would bring about an end to his presidency. And then I kind of imagined Prince Charles looking up at it, going, yes, now is my time, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but of course, this is, you go back to earlier centuries, like a millennium ago, uh, two millennia ago, most of the Roman emperors died in a year where there was a comet. And uh, in some cases it was because their assassinators basically thought, right, the comet's there, now is my time to go. Do you think any of the fear around comets, and I'm just asking this, it's a very hypothetical question, was related to those real close encounters that you, both you and Mike talk about. Those close encounters where at times like the Halley's apparition in 1910, when the Earth passed through the tail of the comet and it was widely believed that the comet was spreading some sort of poison or poisonous gases in the atmosphere. Um, yeah, that, that 1910 was fascinating. I mean, the fear of, of hydrogen cyanide had been just identified. So that was the people were taking cyanide pills and everything. Um, I, there's a part of me that play would tend to play down the physical effects of a comet. And I think this is something that, um, I mean, Mike suggested there might be a dust cloud from a comet and this might've caused the sixth century event. That seems unlikely now. Um, but that said, um, okay, I'm, I'm conscious that the main effect of comets is often cultural. So they, they play a cultural role. And I think um, if you have, let's say a volcano, sixth century, for example, might be a case like this. We have two volcanoes in the sixth century. So I think 536, 540. And, but you have, a, um, Halley's Comet has a really close encounter at, at that time. This is one of those epochs where it causes a major meteor shower in, around 530, 531. It will also appear brighter in the sky at that stage. And so the signs are in the heavens that something is changing. And then if you get a disease and a, and a volcano and a famine and a plague and all of this together, Naturally linked the up. comet plays a role in this. And I think this is what Mike identified in, in Exodus to Arthur, that there were, the sixth century was pretty much pointing the finger at a comet for a lot of this. The, one of the things that I've been doing as, when I did my doctorate was I simulated comet orbits. And that showed me that there were a number of comets that had very close encounters to the Earth. And what you would expect there is that you, the Earth would have encountered the material from the comet. Um, like those comets are still there. So none of those comets struck the Earth, okay? Uh, that's, we can kind of dispense with that idea straight, straight away. But we would have, we encounter comet dust almost every night. I mean, there's pieces of um, comet dust go through the air, let's say four meteors every hour on average. And on certain times, at certain nights you get a meteor shower. So, and that's where we're going through the dust trail left by a comet, often from a long time ago, but we're going through that dust trail. And if a comet just went past and then we go through its dust trail, you'd get this, what's known as a meteor storm, where you might end up with millions of shooting stars falling down. And I mean, I think there's some Temple depictions Tuttle of those. Temple Tuttle would be the yeah. most. 
uh, famous of those sort of meteor storm causing comets. Yeah, let me quickly share this just to. So it's that scenario. Um, we're kind of. Yeah, that's Temple Total, 1833. Yeah. And again, yeah. I think in 66, it is a 33 year period. Yeah, and, and this is the sort of scenario we're kind of talking about. This is a picture from Sagan's and Duran's book where you've got your comet, it's going around the sun, but its orbit coincides with the Earth's. And through my simulations, I worked out that there were times where this setup happened. And it happens with different comets at different centuries, but that's an interesting time. Now, the question then is, is uh, does it just encounter dust or does it encounter larger chunks of material? And I think there's, Comets are interesting. They, they inspire two reactions. One is fear and superstition. And then the other reaction is to downplay all the fear and superstition, to dismiss it as superstition. So what you find is, and I, I've come to realize this, that there's a belief that comets are not dangerous. And this idea that the fear of comets is just superstition is so pervasive that no sensible astronomer would almost want to claim that there's uh, that these are dangerous. Now, I, I kind of exaggerate that a little bit. I mean, Mark Bailey and, and Arma David Asher have been looking at comets as a potential danger. And what they say is that, imagine you've got, you've got asteroids and NASA's focused on asteroids as a, a potential danger to life on Earth and, and rightly so. But they also say you've got comets and comets leave a trail of material. An asteroid is a single point. So they liken it to walking into a darkened room and there's a madman somewhere in the room who's firing random shots through the room. Would you rather he had a rifle or a shotgun? <laughs> and the asteroid is like a rifle, okay? It is a good chance if it hits you, it'll kill you, but there's a good chance that it'll miss you. So it's a single bullet from the rifle, it's going to miss you, you you're okay. The shotgun and the comet are very similar. As you go through the room, there's a good chance that something from this comet will hit you. And one of the, I remember one astronomer giving a talk on Comet Holmes, and um, we didn't know what had happened at this point, but something had emerged from Comet Holmes. So the question was, what? And um, and he kind of imagined, okay, oh, imagine if we were close to it, if the earth was close to it, what would we see? Oh, we, we would just see dust. So straight away, he played it down that we would just see dust. And I thought at the time, but hold on, we, we don't know what has happened. We, this comet might have split in two. So we might encounter half a comet. And actually the, the model that they end up or the explanation that they have for Comet Holmes is that 1% of the comet broke off in a chunk. That piece then, split into further chunks gradually. So you have this hierarchy, this cascade of pieces falling apart. And um, we've seen this again and again. I mean, Comet Schumacher-Levy 9 spl split into 21 pieces. Those 21 pieces crashed into Jupiter. I think the Astronomer Royal at the time predicted that there'd be nothing, that the comet was just like fly ash. This would just be a puff of smoke, no, no effects. Uh, there's and it, that wasn't the case. There, there were major explosions when the, these, these comets hit Jupiter. There was also a, a comet that went into the sun and straight away in the footage, you see this enormous sort of corona sort of explosion. And, and again, that's played down. It sort of thought, oh no, the comet couldn't have done that. That's just coincidence. And, and I think that we don't know enough about these when we do get close to them, like the, you know, the comet with the Rosetta mission, we find that you have this like rubber duck type, you know, uh, lookalike, and it's filled with boulders, with craters. It seems that there's, it's, they're harder than we've often thought, or yeah. they at least contain harder chunks. Um, we, we were told years ago in the era of Patrick Moore's Sky at Night, we were told that they were dirty snowballs but now we know that in fact, they are more like icy asteroids, like they're dense, they're much denser than we, we might have thought before. Yeah. But, but go on, pronounce the name of that comet for me, will you? Chur Churyumov Gerasimenko? <laughs> no, I, <know. laughs> I can't. Yeah, it's 
if you can type it, you'd have to type it in the chat. I've forgotten the name. This is one of those. <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only just having fun. Uh, just for those who don't understand, the naming convention with comets is comets are generally named after their discoverer. The fascinating thing about Halley's Comet was that uh, Halley was, was he 18th century? He, 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 he historically looked back and saw that this comet had appeared every 76 years throughout history. Uh, and so he got to retrospectively name the comet. Uh, Hale, Hale and Bop, Hale Bop were, was named after two, uh, two separate astronomers who basically found the comet at the same time. Patrick, we must move on and talk a little bit about the mythology and some <laughs> specifics. For instance, let me talk to you for a moment about Toynbo Kulnia, which has been a great inspiration for yourself and Mike. You talk about this grotesque depiction of Cucullin in the warp spasm. And a lot of people have, have looked at that and said, what the hell is going on there? You know, what, what happens? Actually, the best visual cue for that is in uh, the Lord of the Rings film when, um, who is it that uh, spikes the dark, the ring wraith on the Pelennor fields with a sword and he, he does all this weird stuff and collapses in upon himself. But you, you have you have an idea about what the warp spasm might represent. And of course, it relates to comets. Uh, it's, it's funny with the, yeah, the warp spasm. Let me see if I can find, yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know if anybody's familiar, but you have Cuchulain becomes this monstrous thing. And uh, he becomes hideous, shapeless. Uh, every part of his body twists around. And this has led some people to think he, he had epilepsy. He starts shaking and, and but he twists it. Um, so all his limbs turn around, his knees turn to the back, etc. cetera. Um, and then you end up with his face sort of opens up and his jaw flaps down, his eye pops in, his, another eye pops out and then flames emerge from his mouth. And you get this smoke goes right up to the sky. Uh, loads and loads of flames emerge from his mouth. So I think one, I think it might have been McAllister, R.A.S. McAllister, who came up with the theory, or Rahali, came up with the idea that he was in fact a fire eater from the Mersey area um, of you know, the tribe called the Setantii, and he had epilepsy. So that was one possible description of Cuchulain. But there are other descriptions of Cuchulain, for example, in the tale of Flavrikrin, where he's on his way to Kruchan, and again, you have fire coming from the mouth of his horses. And, and it actually sounds exactly like a meteor going through the sky. Um, as I was reading this today, in fact, I was thinking to myself, Cuchulain sounds like a volcano as well. So there's that. I'm always kind of conscious of playing the devil's advocate here. So it's not, you know, that a volcano is one possible explanation. And we came up, you know, with the idea, that, no, he's a comet and, um, or, or a meteor. There's something cometary meteoritic about him in that particular description. Um, so what's going to happen now, by the way, for the next couple of weeks is you're going to see volcanoes everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that, that might be the case. Well, let's hope, or hope not. <laughs> it's like... uh, and then, you know, I mean, I was fascinated by all this. You know, Katmai Chura, of course, is now one of the most, the best known sort of stories pertaining to the two of the Danon and their war with the Fomorians. And Lou in that tale is described as having the radiance of the sun, but strangely, uh, Bress remarks that it is strange that the sun has risen in the west tonight when it rises in the east every other day and that got you excited why why was that well i mean this was one of these areas where you come across any character who's described as bright so they could be the an aurora they could be the sun they could be the moon they could be stars planets but when they rise in the west you know you're onto something um so what we did was we, we kind of looked at that particular piece and then tried to work out how close the comet would have to be to overcome the Earth's rotation. So the Earth is rotating, which means that the comet has to be coming up in the West. It's got to be coming up faster than the Earth's rotation. And we worked out that the comet would have to be within roughly, let's say, twice the distance of the moon. Wow. OK. So. That's which is close, but, yeah. you know, but again, the Earth would be reasonably safe from the, 
the piece of the, the main comet itself, but might encounter parts of the comet. And now I'm also conscious that um, there's another part of the description there where he's brighter than the sun. And you'd raise the, the question, is that possible for something to be brighter than the sun? And I think Mark Bailey had always questioned me on this as well. And my feeling was, mm, if you get glare, maybe if the sun hasn't risen, maybe. But it was 2013, there was the meteor that fell at Chelyabinsk in Russia. Oh yeah. And there's footage of that. Mm -hmm. And in the footage from the meteor, you can see suddenly this brightness that goes across the landscape. When the explosion happens, the meteor came in and then it exploded. And the light from that was really visible. And, and, and because daylight, yeah. So, so yeah. the light from that was much brighter than daylight. It was. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of one of those moments where I thought, okay, we're onto something here. Uh, but of course it might mean that what you have is a meteor and not just the comet. So, uh, but again, I think that these phenomena are connected. Yeah, just for the sake of those non-astronomers who might be watching, comets sort of hang around usually for several weeks, sometimes for months in the case of Hale-Bopp. Meteors are these shooting stars you see that uh, appear and disappear generally within a second or two. But in the case of Chelyabinsk and the larger ones that we refer to as fireballs, they can streak across the sky and, and remain visible for half a minute or so. Yeah, fascinating stuff. But you, you also thought there were characteristics, characteristics of Balor. Now, I would have said Balor was solar and that the degrees of burning associated with the opening of his eye were to do with solar symbolism. But you thought that he might have been a comet. Tell, tell us a little bit about how you might have reached that sort of tentative conclusion. Well, again, um, I mean, the, the idea of the eye in the sky, that typically we would see as the sun, the moon. Um, but of course, Comet Holmes sort of showed that it could also be a comet as well. Uh, you could have that roundness. Um, with Balor, again, it's the destructive aspect of Balor um, that comes across. So the sun, the moon, the sun is predictable and, you know, within limits, okay? And um, so the idea that Balor would, you know, by opening his eye, burn all of Ireland in a flash or turn people to stone, that suggests an ability to do stuff that, that the sun doesn't seem to have. I mean, you can have this let's say in a parched landscape where the sun could bake everything and turn it to stone. So maybe you have, what you have is a, is a story moving from there and coming into Ireland as the story of, the, of this Balor having this destructive stone turning ability. But um, the fact also that he's related to Lug, that he appears on this particular battle. And this battle of course is apocalyptic. That's one of the aspects of Kah Moya Turid. So it has this major sort of, it's one of these events that seems to bring about an end to an epoch. And one of the things we now understand about Irish monasticism and early Irish Christianity was that it was apocalyptic in nature. People expected the end of the world. They, they reasoned that God had taken six days to create the universe and one day of rest, and each day was as a thousand years. So the earth was going to be up to about 6,000 years old. And when it was 6,000 years, it would, we would have the end of the sixth age, and then it would have eternity. So what they had worked out, I mean, this is why they were working out the date of the birth of Christ. Was it in 5,200, you know, so you had 5,200 years, that meant you had 800 years before the end. And I think there was a movement in Ireland at the Kayla J movement that, that may have been related to that apocalypse. And then it was, no, it's, it's, it's 1000 or it's 1100. So they kind of expected the end. And of course, what they're interested in is what happened the previous six ages, what happened, or the previous five ages, what happened at the end of those. And Irish monks were interested in this idea that you could take a look at stories from around the world and connect them. And they saw Kahmaya Turid and the Battle of Troy taking place at the same time. In fact, um, they saw this as an Irish version of what had happened at Troy. Um, and, and this is one of the things about comets that it, it, as I say, it offers a whole new framework to interpret myth. 
because up to then what you have is, is myths and stories getting developed independently by different cultures all over the world. And you have, they're looking at the sun, the moon, they're coming up with stories and the stories develop in a certain way, but there's no real reason to connect these individual stories. But when you bring comets into the equation and you bring in this idea that the earth might have gone through a pile of comet debris on a particular day, um, that introduces the idea that in India, this was experienced in one way, in Greece, it was experienced in another way, in Ireland, the same events were experienced in a different way. And that the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, the, uh, the you know, the tale of Troy, so the, the Iliad and Kahmaya Turid might all be a form of history describing events in a couple of days at a certain time. Uh, so, so that's one of the kind of ways that comets make us change our thinking about myth. Uh, it changes it from just being a fiction to a potential form of history. Um, there's another aspect to the, the Battle of Moitura, and this is that Lug hops around on, with one eye closed and one arm raised, and he's hopping on one leg. And I think Kim McCone looked at this and came up with the idea that uh, it was Indo-European warrior culture, and these warriors were wounded, and they got worshipped by being wounded. And that's why you had this one-armed, one-legged character. I've looked at it and I've realized that the same type of character carps up all over the world. Uh, you, we have it in the Maasai, in, in Africa, a whole pile of these sort of characters in, in Africa. So it's not just an Indo-European phenomenon. And as I say, with a comet, it looks like you have the one eye, you have the one arm and you have the one leg. So you have that sort of model for this character. And it seems that uh, many of these tales are talking about comets. And is it the case that Balor, with the poison coming out of his eye, might have been sort of, that's a comet image, is it? it again, it's a bit like the Riesch through, like Kukulin's image, there's something emerging. Again, I'm not quite sure with the poison. Um, I, an area beside me is the poison glen, in, in right at the foot of Erigel. And it's a translation from Glan Nive. Nive and yeah. Glan Nive can either mean the valley of poison, so the poison glen, or it can mean the valley of heaven. heaven. Yeah. So the valley of the sky. And, um, and that's kind of, that's at the back of my mind when I read about Balor and the Sule Nive. Yes, the story says, it talks about poison to explain that, but it might also be Balor of the eye of the sky. Mm. And um, it's, it's funny, I'm gonna share another photo. This is from uh, Tori, let's see. And, and it's, it's actually one of these areas where I'm kind of conscious of the complexity of myth. Um, so what you have here is, is Tori, is the island out of the, the coast. And there's Balor's Tower on the island. Uh, this is where, you know, Luke was conceived, basically. And, and this is it here. And it kind of points north-south. And I realized, I was out there one day a few years ago, I turned around and I realized that this north-south axis was actually pointing down at Dunluy. So that on the one side, I had the, this structure here. Mm. And on the other hand, I had the Poison Glen and Dunluy right across there. And I talked to Brian Lacey about this and he came up with this theory that this was the tribal land of the Shiel Luchta, a, a tribe in the sixth, seventh century. And that these two points, Erigil and uh, Tori formed the northern and southern poles of their tribe. And, and there was a connection between them. And one of the interesting things here is that uh, this tower is made of quartzite, just like Erigil. The rest of Tori is all made of granite, uh, like the most of the mountains in Donegal. So you have almost the geological kind of connection between the two that relates them. So um, again, I'm always conscious that myths and stories work on many, many different levels. Yeah, that's a brilliant observation. I mean, I was at uh, Tory in 2016 and I spent many an evening up on Dune Valor. I just found it a thoroughly captivating, barren, uh, lonely, 
but powerfully, remarkably beautiful landscape. Uh, and I didn't see that. Uh, so that's a brilliant observation. You mentioned in your book, getting away a little bit from the Fomorians and Lou for a moment, you, you suggested in your book that even the Salmon of Knowledge might be a comet. Um, yeah, I mean... You have the, to justify the, that one now. I'd be a bit more hesitant with this <laughs> one. Um, but there was, with the Salmon of Knowledge, I'm conscious that the Salmon came around every seven years. So that immediately had me awaken to this idea that it's it's periodic return mm. and then you have also this idea that the salmon um that ku roy's uh soul was a golden ball in the belly of the salmon and so that again suggested a cometary image because ku roy then is killed with a sword uh, you know hitting this the, taking this fish and the golden ball so that was one side. And then I came across Comet West. And let's see, do I have a picture of Comet West? Um, here we go. So this was Comet West, 1976. And I saw this picture. And, and again, I, I saw a fish, OK? So this is, I've shown this to people. And they've said, no, I still don't see a fish. And I tried drawing a little eye down on the sort of north, near the head of it to try to make it clearer that this looks like a fish. And they said, no, I still don't see it. So I don't know if any of the, if you see it or not, but I saw a fish in this. So I made this connection. Oh, I'm I more conscious more that the, the salmon of knowledge represents a, a whole set of different things though in Irish mythology as well. There's particularly if you read the Well of Segesh, the stories, it's also got a Christian aspect where it's, it's the salmon of knowledge was the knowledge whereby Jesus became man or God became man. So it's had got that dimension to it. It's linked with Boyne. And I, and I often think it's linked with the under the submarine river as well. This is another side of the Boyne. The Boyne was one of these rivers that would flow under the ground and all of the rivers would end up flowing under the sea and then come back into the well, bringing the knowledge with them. And the salmon would appear as part of this sick a part of this cycle. So um, this is something that I, I've i kind of worked, I, my mind thinks a bit like an engineer. I, my training is as an engineer. And when I first came across the idea of comets, for me, it was like, okay, I have the right answer. Here is the answer. It's, these stories are all about comets. And that's kind of a, I mean, the, having an engineering mind is wonderful because it allows me to see assumptions that underlie a discipline. So I often recognize what basic assumptions people are making at the, you know, in, in their particular discipline that they often don't think about. And I often see that, I see what the weaknesses or strengths of that, those assumptions are. But one of the downsides of an engineering training is that it makes you think you have the right answer. And many years of going to conferences on Irish uh, stories have taught me that there are multiple answers, that there are many, many, many ways of looking at these stories, of interpreting them. And, and now I would probably talk more of the idea of cometary aspects or cometary motifs, or, you know, so I'd be much more um, reticent. It's a case of the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Yes, yeah. I, I would have to say that uh, having spent enough time in the company of academic archaeologists and all sorts of uh, scholars over the years, that uh, if one is to come up with a hypothesis, one may all, must also present at least two possible alternatives. So in your conclusion, you say, well, it could be this, but it could also be this and that. And here, by the way, is the depiction in your book of the comet with the with the salmon beside it and and it, it seems like slightly more likely from that i think it's a sort of better illustration of it um comets can rotate right now this is something that doesn't happen very often if a comet's coming straight towards earth and it's rotating what can happen is that the gas jets and the there's a dust tail and a gas tail quite quite often is that they start to curve right and you suggest that they can take on the appearance of for instance a catherine wheel a swastika or, or a triskel does this help explain some symbols in irish myths such as for instance mogruth's falls wheel okay um good question um i mean I'll, I'll, again i'll share one particular image here and this is from a Chinese drawing. And this 
drawing has 29 different types of comments, um, raising questions of how long would you have to be observing to come <laughs> up with 29 different types. But one of them is the long-tailed pheasant star. It's this one at the bottom right-hand corner. And you can see the one beside it looks like it's got four jets coming out of it. And this one looks as if it's coming straight towards the earth and it's rotating. So it's doing this type of action. And it looks like the swastika. Carl Sagan, the We're having uh, um, And then when you look at rotation in Irish stories, uh, you know, it also seems to make sense. Increasingly, I'm not totally convinced by this. I've come to appreciate that the swastika is associated with, let's say, St. Bridget's Cross, and that it's a symbol of the turning of the seasons. And you get this specifically in, in, in Hindu mythology where it's the turning of the ages. So you have these four long-term periods turning. But I think the, 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 the seasons do this. So if you turn from one season into the next, to the next, to the next, you have this rotation movement. And I think that may well be the origin of the swastika in terms of its um, meaning. But this is one of the things about events and observation. Things can reinforce something. So you see something, it reinforces it. So if you have a St. Bridget's cross and then suddenly you see a comet that looks like a St. Bridget's cross, that reinforces aspects of the character, of how strong that character must be, um, of how powerful her sign is, etc. cetera. <clears throat> um, by the way, this is the St. Bridget's cross fascinates me. It's a clear indication of the preservation of tradition. This is one of the kind of debates in Irish studies uh, for the past 30 years is that do we have any traditions that carry on or not? The St. Bridget's Cross is pre-Christian. There's no question about that. Mm. And it has survived. It has survived to today. And um, so it's a classic example of survival of tradition. Brilliant. I like the way, by the way, I have to commend you. I love the fact, um, I always admire a scholar who is willing to step back from their own hypothesis and say, well, look, you know, I'm not completely married to this stuff. There are other alternatives. Uh, nobody likes somebody who's got all the answers, you know, and uh, when we're dealing in the realm of interpretive uh, interpretation, it, it always helps to say, well, look, this is one possibility and here are other possibilities. There are fascinating descriptions in some Irish myths of showers of stones, which you describe perhaps as being meteor showers or debris falling from comets. Um, I mean, this is... Yeah, one of those areas, I mean, um, you can have people throwing stones at each other. And uh, Cuchulain, for example, is, he is known for using a slingshot. And um, in fact, there's another example of survival in some ways, uh, because I think this in, in England at one of the Iron Age ring forts, there's, uh, they found a, a lot of these sort of stones that were perfect for slingshots. So we know that in the Iron Age they were using that, but... <clears throat> um, so you have that possibility that you're basically got armies throwing stones at each other, but that's not what you get in the tales. In the tales, you get this idea of two characters flinging stones at each other so that the ground is absolutely covered in stones. And what's interesting there is whenever meteors fall, um, particularly, I think in the, there's a, one in the 1492, there was a meteor that fell. There was one in Bamberg that fell it got depicted as the result of an army fighting in the sky. And this is, let me see if I have a picture of that. It's, uh, it's a bit lost. Um, I, I like this image if you can find it. Uh, yeah, here we have. So we have the, the Bamberg fireball, 28th December 1560. And this fireball fell uh, to the ground. Okay, so you have this fireball. And then the image shows these two armies fighting each other in the sky. So, so that's, it, it just shows the level of interpretation. So people would see something fall to the ground. What's the explanation for this? There must be armies fighting up in the sky. 
<clears throat> and it's one of the reasons that stories of meteors or meteorites falling were dismissed as unscientific, as unreal, completely unrealistic. These were just peasant superstitions. And there's a kind of classic debate that took pre uh, place within, the, I think, the Académie de la the Sciences in, Fran in France, so where it took them a long time to come around to the idea to accept that people had observed um, meteorites falling. Um, mm. so. Patrick, just uh, two things. First of all, to say that we, we, we probably have about 10 minutes to run. I have probably about four or five more questions. Uh, Patricia McAteer raises an interesting comment, and that is so maybe the Kalyak is a type of comet because she's often depicted as dropping stones. And if 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 you've read uh, Patricia uh, Garoj or Kroilek's book about the Kalyak, in fact, there are several tales about two Kalyaks throwing stones at each other, uh, which would seem to fit the, the the type of story that Patrick is talking about. But we must move on a little bit, Patrick, from the, the myths and talk to us a moment about dendrochronology and where that comes in, because we, you mentioned it earlier, uh, and this is where Mike Bailey's expertise, uh, I suppose, comes into it too. And this is the study of tree rings. Why is the study of tree rings important to your comet hypothesis? Well, um, in a way, this is what gave rise to it. I mean, in a sense, this is Mike's discoveries of tree rings that led him to this story. Um, I, Mike is in the audience. He might be the best person to answer this, actually. Um, but I don't know if he wants to. I'd be more than happy for him to do in. that if he didn't feel like he was he was being put on the spot. Uh, that would be that would be great. Uh, but can we hear? Uh, tree rings were, I mean, developed in Belfast. You have it was important for carbon dating, and so you end up with this chronology of tree rings. And then what was noticed that you have a climate record. Ah, there, Mike. So you can take Hi this there. question. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can hear you fine, Mike. Good, good. Uh, yes, well, I, I had been involved in building a long tree ring chronology in Ireland to calibrate radiocarbon dating. And uh, we had more or less completed that by about 1984, five, six. And uh, we were then left with this chronology. And of course, in Ireland, um, we know nothing much ever happens environmentally. It never gets very hot, never gets very cold. But I noticed that in this long 7,000 year tree ring record, there were some extreme negative events. In other words, where the trees had almost closed down growth for a number of years. And I set out to try and find out the cause of these. And the initial hypothesis was that they were the results of big volcanic dust faves. And then it's, it's a long story, but I'll not trouble you with it. Um, because there was an error in the ice core chronologies, there was no volcanic acid at the 536, 540 AD dates that Patrick mentioned. Um, and I played around with, well, what else could cause this global environmental downturn? Because yeah. the thing about dendrochronology is everything's precisely dated. And you can hence look at trees, not just from Ireland, but from England, Germany, as far across as uh, uh, Mongolia and across America and even down into the Southern Hemisphere. And in uh, 1994, I published an article pointing out that you could see the environmental effects of 536, 540 basically right around the globe. So it was the first global event that anyone had ever uh, come across. And because there was no volcanic acid in the ice cap, I, su I suggested basically that that was probably a cometary event. And as Patrick so eloquently put it, once you've got comets in your head, you start to see them everywhere. <laughs> so, so I think it's fair to say that my hypothesis now would be that these events are real environmental downturns which had catastrophic effects on human populations, but they were mostly caused by volcanoes. But as in the case of 536, 540, there wasn't just Halley in the 530s, there was a comet visible for months in 539. So people were experiencing on the ground the effects of a distant volcano, but they were seeing 
a comet in the sky. And because they probably carried a lot of uh, baggage from ancient lore, they made the assumption that the effects were the, the, the result of a sky god. So that's... Um, and, and, and if you don't mind but, me asking, what, what, ha what, what do you reckon would... So say you have this period where there are extremely narrow rings, meaning there's what? Zero growth. What is the effect of that? Nobody can eat. Is that the, is that the net result? Well, the implication is that you have associated famines. And uh, I think the big one to watch out for is whatever it was that happened at 2350 BC, because at 2350, you have about a 10 year triggering effect. And it's beginning to look as if there was a really major population replacement in Ireland, but not just in Ireland yeah. at that time. Yeah. And that's where you get this curious interlocking of, of evidence where Jim Mallory is interested in the DNA evidence. I'm interested in the tree ring and environmental evidence. Mm. And uh, of course, there's all of the, you know, the archaeology. And the one to look out for is Orkney, because it's almost certain in my mind uh, <laughs> that the uh, Ness of Brodker came to an end abruptly in 2350 BC. And they have now got the great feast and the deconsecration, and they're talking about dates of around 2400 and around 2300. So it's pretty clear they're aiming for 2350, which is the tree ring event. Fascinating. Just one more question, Mike. There were how many uh, narrowing events did you identify in the record? Basically, there, were, there was roughly one per, per millennium. So one roughly every thousand years, but not on a thousand year period, just, you know, per millennium is roughly one. Yeah. And it's fair to say it's not the sort of thing you would want happening in the modern era because we would, we would be faced with utter disaster. Uh, well, my view is that if, if any one of those events happened, it would collapse our current civilization. Thanks, uh, Mike, for joining us. Brilliant that we have you along to ask a few questions, uh, seeing that you are you are both uh, partners in this uh, venture. Patrick, could I ask you, what, what evidence might there be in mythology pertaining to those, uh, you know, environmental disasters uh, coinciding with the narrowing of the tree rings? Or is there any, is that a too broad a question? Sorry, I, I had muted myself. Um, yeah. Um... <clears throat> It's funny, I think one of the questions you raised a, a few weeks ago when you were looking at the Celtic gods, or a few months ago, was the red comet. And you'd kind of suggested, look, a comet can't appear red. Uh, how is this possible? <laughs> and 44 BC is an example of a red comet. So it's recorded that there was a red comet appeared, a reddish yellow, uh, amber colored. There was another one, 147 BC. And volcano is actually an explanation for that. You've got volcanic dust in the upper atmosphere and that refracts the, the light. So you end up with this reddish appearance on the comet. And the, within Irish mythology, you have Fergus Macriach, you know, loses the kingship of Ulster because there's a year of darkness. And uh, I think when Deirdre comes, she's, she sees a cloud, I see it red. There's that sort of, uh, this warning sign of a red cloud, a red, you know, so that, that crops up there as well. Um, whether it's a comet or just another cloud, <laughs> hard to tell, but uh, the fact that it's linked with kind of, you know, tales of disaster, tales of darkness, uh, suggests that you at least have some of these elements coming together in the stories. Well, uh, there's a, a piece of, there's a, a cake here on the desk. I'm just about to eat some of it. I'm going to eat a slice of humble pie. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, it was a good question and uh, well worth asking. So <laughs> in, in fairness, it's, it's, it's brilliant because in my experience, uh, as I say, of 25 years of observing comets, I've never seen one that looked red. But what you describe makes it, of course, highly plausible. Um, just moving towards the conclusion, um, have you published, I mean, uh, Celtic Gods is now, what, 16 years old. 
have you published any more recent research around this? Has have has it moved on at all? Or I have, I, I, I funny. I read through the Celtic Gods probably for the first time in about um, ten or so years. I have this that I've been reading through um, just the past few days, and um, that's my PhD thesis on the topic. I've never published it. I need a kind of a kick, uh, to, so. It's... Well, uh, well, we'll all administer a kick right now. Everybody, can <laughs> <a kick. laughs> yeah. Well, I, 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 I look forward to seeing more about it. I think it's a fascinating subject, and you've opened up my eyes. I'm an astronomer and a fan of comets, and you've opened up my eyes to the whole thing since the publication of the book. What has been the reaction to it among a the general reading public and b among scholars? Um. I mean, the general ready public, I think we sold about a thousand copies. So it had its initial print run and then it, it went out of print uh, and it became one of these um, expensive books, which you sometimes see. Do you ever see on Amazon where you have, um, you know, you go through the page and there's books like 20 euros, 25 euros, and then there's somebody with like 650 euros and you go, what are they on? And that happened this book where all that was left on the page was, 650 euros and I went into Oxfam in Belfast and saw the Celtic gods in the glass shelf with rare and expensive books because somebody had looked it up and seen this price now nobody had ever paid more than probably 40 euros for it but that's uh, the nature of the kind of rare book market so we sold about a thousand copies but it um, it generated interest we had an RTE nationwide did a piece on it RT did another piece, I think, Secrets of the Stones. BBC had a documentary, The Comet's Tales. And then there was Tile Films did a piece with T.G. Kahar and the Smithsonian, um, you know, Sacred Sites, Ireland. So there was that interest. Um, from the academic side, there was also interest. Um, I mean, I spoke in, I was in Australia at a conference 2007, and then I spoke at the Celtic Studies Congress in Bonn in 2007. And for my paper, I had, you know, not just like almost they had to take two rooms almost and, and they were filled. So I ended up with a really like a huge amount of people were interested in this topic. I kind of conscious that if the topic hasn't made its way into print and into reference lists and citation lists, that's because I probably didn't explain it very well or I I'm always kind of conscious that when you take you step into a discipline, especially something like Irish studies, and you step in and you go, hey, I have the answer. Listen to me. Here's what it's all about. Um, it's pretty much the sure way to get up everybody's nose. Um, and also I, I would look back and think, OK, I was pretty naive about some of the debates that had happened within the discipline. <clears throat> and one of those debates was the preservation of tradition. The fact that uh, most of the tales that we have are from the medieval world, from a Gnostic medieval world. They were written down by literate people who knew their Bible, who knew their classical mythology. Yeah. So straight away on the title, we have, I think the word Celtic <laughs> uh, was a problematic and the word mythology was problematic and almost inspires disbelief among people. But as I say, credit to Irish study scholars they were curious, they gave me that sort of hearing in a sense. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, then I went on to do a PhD in it. And again, that ultimately was accepted, so. Yeah, well, as I say, I think it's always refreshing to hear a scholar saying, look, this is what I wrote and it ain't necessarily the whole truth and everything but the truth and all that. Um, just before we wrap up, uh, if there are, couple of, uh, uh, if you don't mind, Patrick, we might just allow a couple of live uh, questions from the audience. So perhaps if you want to raise your hand or otherwise allow Tracy, John McHugh has her hand up straight away. Uh, Tracy, if you could identify a couple of people who want to ask questions, 
um, I'll wrap up by saying that my own view of the great monuments of Bruno Bonia is that there's considerable inspiration in the design of the monuments from the movements of the sun, the moon, the planets and the stars, and that some of that is encoded in the associated mythology. Why do you think it is that generations of experts have failed to see that and that they're married to this idea of the sun god, the sun god, the sun god, and there doesn't seem to be a moon or stars or planets or comets in their purview? Oh, that's a good, yeah, another good question. Um, I'm kind of conscious that academia has become specialized. And I mean, the nature of reading, um, you know, if you take up a discipline, you start with one or two subjects, you focus then on one aspect of it, then you go on to do your PhD on one specific aspect. And there's enough reading to do in that section. So interdisciplinary work is, it's a nice idea, it's encouraged, but it often, um, it's not that easy to do at the early stages. And I think that, so what you end up with is almost a funneling of information. So you have archeologists and archeology, span this is what I find unusual. There are not many archeologists who are interested in, in mythology. Mm. I mean, Jim Mallory is, is, you know, he is, he kind of takes a look at the two worlds. Yeah. Um, you go to a, medieval studies conference, for example, on Irish medieval narratives, you almost never get an archeologist there because archeologists from the Iron Age has nothing to do with these medieval narratives today because there's a disconnect. There's a sense that the stories have nothing to do with the Iron Age. Therefore, we are medieval scholars here. Your Iron Age archeologists over there, you do your thing, we do ours. In fairness, in Ireland, I think that there are people who challenge that. I mean, I think the archaeologists in Ireland are very conscious that when you're excavating a site, you have a body of, of tales associated with the site. And yeah. archaeologists have been great at, you know, engaging with those stories of Tara, et cetera. I mean, Connor Newman's work, Edel, you know, Elizabeth Brown has. So they're, they're pretty good in Ireland. And I think it also there's probably been more acceptance of archaeoastronomy in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, generally than in Britain. But that said, in Britain, you have people like Nicholas Campion as well, who, who've looked at this, Clive Ruggles as well. Um, I mean, it, it reminds me of Clive Ruggles. Clive Ruggles has a statement that to understand these sites, we've got, we can't think of them as astronomical observatories. That's not what people were building at, at something like Newgrange. We, there are astronomical alignments they, there are, these are religious structures, but to understand them, we need to think in terms of the symbolism. Yeah. And, and that's where mythology comes in. I think to me, these are the three key disciplines um, that you, you need the three to actually, to really get at the heart of why something was built, what it was built for. And, um, and I will praise you because this is one of those areas where I find that what you're doing brings a lot of this stuff together. And, and I particularly, I think I came across a piece in Island of the Setting Sun. And, and to me, that was key to kind of working out what Knoth was about. And, um, you know, so that's, I'd encourage you to keep going with that. It's Yeah, yeah. And I'm surprised myself at how, how little some of the archaeological community know, A, about mythology, and B, especially about astronomy. Uh, and they are disciplines that perhaps we could do with more uh, sort of study of in relation to archaeological sites. Anyway, that's uh, great, Patrick. Uh, we have two questioners. Uh, 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 Joan is one, and I think Dr. Ken Limer wants to ask a question. Just before I do that, just to say that I can announce the next two guests next week, uh, all going well, and I just have to sort out the technicalities. Uh, I will have as my guest Bob Quinn, who uh, is best known for his work, his TV series in the 1980s, The Atlantean Irish, from which he derived a book called The Atlantean. And we're going to be talking to Bob about uh, connections between Irish Shanno singing types of boats, uh, language, etc., uh, with, uh, you know, North Africa and the Near East. The following week, so that's next Monday, which is the 15th, the following week on the 22nd of March, I will have as my guest, the archeologist, Geraldine Stout. And Geraldine has been doing 
huge amount of work, especially in the Boyne Valley over the past 20 years, lots of excavation, but also some work examining mythology, for instance, the Dunshanicus uh, and the mention of various monuments at Brunabonia there. So I'll be picking Geraldine's brain in two weeks time. And uh, there are two that we can look forward to. In the meantime, uh, Joan, would you like to unmute and ask uh, Patrick your question? There we go. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody, and thanks very much, Patrick. That was a great evening. Um, just curious, somebody mentioned earlier about the Kyliac, but I I'm more interested in um, the Maragu uh, and the Katmachura, uh, when they rained down um, blood and fire. Could that also have something to do with uh, comets, especially now they're, they were, they're, they're also women and it's International Women's Day today. So I, I'm just wondering, is there any reference to female, female comets? Um, yeah, I, I had good question, John. Yes, there are. I mean, I, I think that you have um, the, the, the long hair, for example, that you get with a comet. I mean, to me, Rapunzel on, in standing in the tower letting down her long hair would be, for example, a classic comet image um, there. The Morrigan is really interesting, particularly in Kaf Moyaturid. She gives an apocalyptic prophecy at the end. So, and a lot of the imagery in Kaf Moyaturid is of the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, it reflects what you get in the book of Revelation. So in the book of Revelation, you have the you know then the angel threw the star to the ground and then you have the dragon sweeps a third of the stars from the sky onto the ground so you have very clear apocalyptic meteoritic cometary imagery in revelation and you certainly have that in kah mm -hmm. um, there's also a sort of a triple symbolism of um, earth fire and water so what you get are the three things coming together you have the 12 mountains will do stuff there will be 12 showers of fire and then the 12 lakes um, will dry up so you have those three aspects coming together and i i kind of gave a talk in Trier some years ago where i looked at the this triple worship because i reckon you get that at newgrange this sort of sun moon and earth and i see it in the iron age um, with let's say era banba fola, that you get this kind of the mori no the, the yeah you, you have it with the moriagan as well where you have the three names um, nevej bav and macha mm -hmm. and I would link macha to land uh, nevej to the nevej to the sky and then bav I suggested might as we have it with this sense of being drowned might have something to do with water. And so I kind of see a certain continuity there of these three elements um, represented in, in by, by these three women right through uh, the epochs. So, Thank you, Patrick. That, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. I, I was mistaken. That was somebody else's comment mentioning Dr. Ken Limer. Is there someone else, if you just want to um, wave your hand, if there's someone else that wants to ask a question, we'll quickly just keep your hand up there and we'll quickly scroll through. The, I don't see anyone. Um, so you're all shy tonight, you know, or either that or you're like me, totally mesmerized by uh, Patrick's uh, wonderful knowledge. Uh, I, I, if there isn't another, there's a, no obligation on anybody to ask questions, of course. Um, and if there isn't, well, then I'll just wrap up by saying, uh, Patrick, on behalf of myself and everyone who's here, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to participate. Uh, thank you for what uh, I think you'll all agree has been a thoroughly fascinating conversation. Look forward to seeing the publication of your thesis, hopefully in the near future consider it done that we've given you uh, encouragement uh, on that front um, and uh, thank you for being with us tonight you're you're in um, somewhere in Europe I can't remember exactly Leipzig is it yeah I, I live in Leipzig so I've been here yeah six years um, I taught Irish in Poland for a year and I taught Irish here for four years four and a half years uh, but now I'm teaching English so Brilliant. 
a man of many talents. Well, Patrick, thank you very much. Uh, everybody, we'll do just the very last thing that we do every week is uh, everybody just unmute and say good night. Just mute that for a second. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Tracy. Bye. 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 Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick and Anthony. Thanks, everyone.